Rizzle Briscoe and Bradshaw. I will be Bradshaw. And that would be the WWE Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we have got a guest we are excited about, and we have been waiting for weeks to get one of the most iconic legendary figures in sports entertainment, professional wrestling, whatever the heck you want to call it, history. And also when talked about, he's always mentioned that guy's a really smart, brilliant man. He is Mr. Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Thank you, baby. Thank you. Great introduction. And uh, you should, you're going to be given the uh, Medal of Freedom for dealing with Frisco. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, not you, brother. I was just going to put you over. John, this is one of the guys I've known just about the entire, my entire career. I first met Kevin at Daytona Beach, Florida. We were, we were both over there uh, on the beach one, one Saturday afternoon. Him and Mike Graham pulls up. And they come, they see my car out from this hotel and they, they come, they track me down and Kevin, Kevin is probably the, uh, she knows you, John, so you, but you don't count. <laughs> Kevin's probably the first professional wrestler that my wife ever met besides me. Yeah. Hey, I'm in my ground. Yeah. Back in 1971. So Kevin and I go way, 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 way back. And man, you talk about an iconic guy. Kevin, Kevin was sharp to the business when I first met him. I think you had just gotten a business yourself back in that day, 1970, right? Yep. Yep. I just got in. But I mean, okay. I yeah, tell us, lucky. tell us, tell, tell us that story, Kevin. I know I, I you, you're from Boston. You're, you're right. a damn Red Sox fan. And that's one thing I always have to forgive you for. And I refuse to. <laughs> to take a picture of you when you got those damn uh, Red Sox t-shirts on. That's a year like, you're like Layfield with Texas. Seems like that's your 99% of your wardrobe is that Red Sox wardrobe there. But, Wait a minute. What do you got against the Red Sox? You're from Oklahoma. I, well, you... well I, I know what my Tampa Bay Rays beat the hell out of them every year. Even though Boston spends 10 times more on payroll than, than, than my Rays do, we still manage well, to beat the, beat the crap out of them every year. Well, maybe they would really win if the Rays spent the dime. <laughs> they play inside of a tin can, not, not a building that's 120 years old. Yeah. But uh, yeah, well, that, 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 that's not a tin can, man. It's, it's a dip, uh, dempsey dumpster or whatever they call those <laughs> damn things, man. Uh, you know, it, it's not so bad once you get inside that park, but getting there and getting inside that damn thing is it, awful. But once you get inside the ball game, it's still good because we have so much talent on the field, unlike the Red Sox, you know. But anyway, Kevin, Kevin, you, 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 you were just like I said, I, I, you were one of the first guys my wife ever met that was in the, in the business. But how did how did Kevin Sullivan become Kevin Sullivan? I know you worked up, up in up in uh, Canada under a, yeah. under another name, but you weren't really formally trained or anything, right? You did a little high school wrestling, and then yeah. you just what made you wanted to get in this crazy world of professional wrestling? Well, it, I actually got in by accident. I was wrestling for the Boston YMC Union. It's the second oldest athletic club. This guy came in. And he said, you want to train? He's only about 180 pounds. And I was about 210 at the time. And after we worked out a couple of times, he said, told me his story. He graduated from Oxford and Harvard Business School. He was from, the, he was from South Africa. He was one of the, the Berry families that owned the Diamond Mines. Wow. And he couldn't become a pro wrestler because it was beneath his standings. But he was <laughs> the wrestler. And you, he used to wrestle back in the day, like on, uh, they'd be called Independence today. And he said, hey, I'll get you a match in Montreal. And that's when there was the Rougeos and the Vachons had that big war up there. Right, yeah. But there was a guy named Pat Gerard who trained all those guys, Pat Patterson, Ronnie Garvin, uh, Terry Garvin, uh, I think he actually he helped train uh, the giant. So they would let both sides wrestle for him on a Sunday. And I went up and they gave me a match. And then it, it was from there, I got in the business. So I was lucky enough to get in the business. Wow. Yeah. So and the then of course, what? I'm sorry. So the match itself that you were in that first match, they stick you in a professional wrestling ring and you've, 
You don't know anything well, about a work, nothing, right? It, it goes better than that. You know, <laughs> I, I knew you couldn't pull a guy down by his tights and, you know, every, you couldn't arm whip a guy across the ring. But I'm waiting in the dressing room. My friend's with me. He was on an early match. And I said, when are they going to tell me what I'm going to do? He said, let me talk to the referee. The referee said, in a minute, I'll be back. This went on all, all time. The bell's ringing. Now, they had a star that worked for uh, the Rougeos called Fernand Fischek, but he's a good friend of the promoter. So he used to go over and wrestle under a mascot. So I'm wrestling him and I we both go down to the mat and I get up and I kick him and I don't know how to kick and I hear him go, oh, and he rolls up under the apron and grabs on the ropes. Well, I had seen the slingshot, that old deal where you slingshot a guy back in the ring. Well, I hit the opposite ropes and came off for about 30 miles an hour, knocked him back into the third row. Uh, Here's this guy, Fernand Fischette, the big star, wrestling under a mask, maybe as the Avenger. Pulls off his mask and starts swearing in French. He goes back to the dress room. I said, I jump up on the second rope and I'm yelling, come back, come back. I get down and I said, oh, I'm either going to get in a fight and I probably get my ass really whipped. I go back and he confronts me. He says, what the, f what the hell are you doing? And I said, well, nobody told me anything. And the referee was going by. He grabbed the referee by his throat and said, you didn't tell him anything? He said he could have killed him or killed me. And he calmed down and he said, you come up here next week, a couple of hours early, and I'll, I'll teach you something. So he was very instrumental in helping me. Yeah, but I, I was sitting away. It was a horrible rib and it wasn't a rib i'm sitting there what are they going to tell me what to do what are they going to tell me what to do oh we'll be back in a minute <laughs> well the rib was on him right yeah i mean yeah. they put this young big bodybuilding uh, tough kid in the ring with him and don't smarten the kid up and, and he thinks the kid's smart and the ribs on him yeah 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 but then i was lucky enough like a year later i was in florida which was at at the time, the most premier territory in the country, and what a bunch of talent they had. And I was lucky enough to see Jerry work and Jack Briscoe work and be around Eddie. You know, he was a genius by far, don't you think, Jerry? Oh, I'm glad you brought that up, Kevin. Eddie Graham, I mean, what a, what a tree that Eddie Graham that sprouted out. I mean, you know, the Dusty Rhodes and all, all the guys that, that came under that uh, under that learning tree. But if you didn't learn something from Eddie Graham, you weren't trying to learn. You didn't care about this business because Eddie was such a detailed guy, John. He'd just break things down in little pieces where anybody could understand them. Even a Texan, you know, could understand them. <laughs> he, had, he had Dick Murdoch, you know, being a, being a big star, of course, everywhere with Dick Murdoch when he was a big star, but, but well, Eddie, 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 Eddie had, 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 and Kevin, you know this, Eddie had so much respect for Kevin, even at that early age. Kevin, you were almost a family member with, with Eddie and Mike and Lucy and, and a family there. They, they just adored you because you were a hard worker. You'd learn, we lost you again. <laughs> <laughs> This is going to be great. <laughs> yeah, you know, I bet, I bet what it is. Yeah, I bet he's on his phone. I bet he's getting calls. Yeah. That's well, they get calls because they're seeing him on this show, you know. That's right. They see him <laughs> on this show and everybody wants to call him. Everybody's got his number. Yeah. Now what are we going to do? It may be like Tim White. We may never see him again. <laughs> no, he won't do that to us. There he is. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, we can add our Silva can edit that Sorry. shit out. Right? I'll edit out. Okay. Sorry, uh, no yeah, problem. But, uh, Turn I, the I camera would... on. Turn the camera on. Okay. There you are. <laughs> so, yeah, I was lucky that they did. They brought me in like a surrogate son. But, uh, John, you'll appreciate this. No matter who was the booker, Jerry will tell you. On Tuesdays, Eddie was the booker. And he would give you finishes that were like three and a half minutes long. 
And John, you wouldn't think he would be watching all those matches, right? But I remember this, me and Mike were in a tag match and I was supposed to do this thing Well, was wrestling the late great Bobby Shane, who your brother and you had great matches with yeah. and gorgeous George Jr. And the finish was something yeah. like we had, he shoots me and goes back up me. I roll him up. He kicks his legs. I run on the apron. He grabs me by the head, runs me to the turnbuckle, you know, outside. I put up my foot. I hit him. I take his head, hit it into the turnbuckle. I dive off the top. He catches me, but we roll over. He's on top. One, I kick out. He goes to shoot me off. I go behind him. Uh, I put the sleeper on him. He he kicks out the sleeper, hits the ropes. I drop down, leapfrog him, and I hit him with three drop kicks. I, I tag Mike. Mike comes off the top, drops a knee on him, puts the figure four, right? Well, I only did two drop kicks when I came Ooh. back. I just came back proud as hell, right? Because I remember the finish, and I said to Eddie, hey, that finish worked out great. He said, where was the third drop kick? <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Why, why was why was Tuesday the the, the day that he gave finishes? Wax was TV Tampa. day. Oh, it I got Tampa, 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 yeah, Tampa, yeah. yeah. Tampa Armory, the the, yeah. the Taj Mahal of wrestling, as they call yeah. it down there. But yeah. but you 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 you're right. I mean, when and I, I knew where you're going as soon as you said three drop kick because that was Eddie's Eddie's. Forte with three three drop kicks for some yeah. reason. He loved yeah. he loved that setup, and he he would give you a finish, John, that you would be sitting there listening to. Holy shit! I'm supposed to remember all this when I go out there. And if you did, if you left out one little minute detail, Eddie gave you come here, kid. Let me. Why do you leave that out? Yeah. You know, if, if you would have added that in there, it would have added so much. And it, after he explained it to you. You understood why he would want it like that, but but every finish, it didn't matter what card you were on, what what uh, position in the card, he would give finishes like that to the from the opening match, and I think that's the reason Florida was so solid because right. every match had detailed finishes to it, not just there you go out in five minutes and go over. He'd lay out a detailed finish that would get the people interested in 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 those first two or three matches every time. And John, I like to say this, you know, a lot of people talk about the best matches of all times or this guy had not disparaging anybody, Randy and uh, Steamboat, Flair and Steamboat, but the greatest matches in my lifetime was Jack and Dory Funk. Yeah, I agree. And that was like watching Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dance. They and were, none of None of the matches were the same either. Were no, Kevin. that was the craziest thing. I remember they went uh, an hour in Tampa on Tuesday, uh, and then they were back in Jacksonville on Thursday and went an hour. And Leo Garibaldi, a forgotten name who was very smart, he came back after they went an hour and they were coming through that big hallway there. Right. And he looked and he said, I love it, I love it. Yesterday's finish was today's high spot. I mean, <laughs> they, 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 they were, it was incredible. It was like watching Picasso paint both of them. It was incredible. Was that his favorite opponent, Jerry? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, and Jack, Jack says in his book, you know, they, they asked Jack, and Kevin, you'll like his quote. I, I, I don't know if you read Jack's book or not, but they asked Jack, what, what, what do you think the biggest moment in your career was? He said, when Dory Funk Jr. won the World Heavyweight Championship and gave guys like me a, an opportunity to, to, to go out there and win something. Yeah. So, uh, but you mentioned that Leo Garibaldi. I mean, what, 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 what guys we had to learn from down here in this territory. You mentioned Bobby Shane. You know, probably, John, Bobby Shane was, to me, uh, a young Pat Patterson that never saw his career balloon up to what it would have been if he would have survived that plane crash. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll remember, I remember this too. Bobby and Jack went 55 minutes in the Bayfront 
and I was in the dressing room when they were giving the finishes because the bayfront was small, remember? Yeah. It wasn't like Tappy, you went into that glass room with anybody yourself. And he, and Bobby John was the hottest tail in the territory. And he said to both of them, 45 minutes before a punch is thrown, and I'm saying to myself, how's Bobby, the number one heel, going to get by with that? And they got by with wrestling and sneaky maneuvers by Bobby. And when Jack beat him, it was like a, they had been in a Texas street fight. It was, I, I couldn't believe it because here's the top heel not throwing a punch and get all kinds of heat because he's out wrestling Briscoe because he's done something a little tricky. And the people that had so much heat, Eddie just knew timing. That was it, right? He was the conductor. We were the uh, orchestra, and he knew where the drum should have come in and when the horn section should have come in. It was amazing to me. And, and Bobby Shane was the one that gave Jerry Lawler the crown. Right. Yeah, you know, but we were told a story when Jerry Lawler was on the show that uh, before he Jerry had been called called himself the king of Memphis just off the cuff one time, right. and right. Bobby Shane says, "Hey, I've got this crown. I'm going to Australia." He goes, "Why don't you just take my crown?" And Jerry used it for a while because he couldn't get one ordered in time. And then when Bobby came back and unfortunately was killed in the plane crash, and right. uh, that's how Jerry originally became the the king was off of King Bobby Shane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, how did you end up down in Florida? Like from the time you started to, how, how did you end up getting booked down in Florida to begin with? What was that I, progression? I got really lucky. Uh, this is funny. Uh, Dutch Mantel's brother, Red, Man, uh, Red Cowan, had a territory in Georgia, not Georgia, South Carolina. And it was opposition. And remember Johnny Heidelman? Oh, yeah, Johnny Heidelman. Great, great journeyman. Yeah, Johnny came over and he said, everybody thought he got fired by Crockett, but he was a spy. You know, and he came up to me in Dutch and says, I was supposed to hurt you guys, but I think you guys got a chance. So they sent Dutch to Crockett and sent me to Tennessee, and they put me and Robert together. And that's when Buddy bought into Florida. And Robert took me to Florida with him. And that's we, Fuller. I'd be in Fuller, Robert, Robert, yeah, Buddy, yeah. Fuller. Yeah. And then when Robert took me to Florida, they put him with Ron and put me with Mike. So that's how I got there. That's how Robert. you got. And that's how you got with Mike. I didn't know that story. I was going to ask that question. How did you end up with Mike? Because I, I remember I was coming in and out. I was in the Carolinas at the time. And I know yeah. you had started out with one of the Fullers. Yeah. And then I ended up because Ronald went. That's when Ronald took over West Palm. Yeah. And they put Ronald and Robert together as a team and me and Mike as a team. And you and Mike just blended in. Now, you and Mike had a lot of the same uh, same likes and everything. You guys were both heavy into the, the power lifting and the bodybuilding and all that. I heard a story. I don't know uh, what, uh, who, who, who was on, so I, I forgive me, but I might give credit to the proper guy. But I heard what, what, in your bodybuilding days, you ran into a very young Jim Helwig uh, up in Tennessee or somewhere. I ran into him at the... Uh... I was training for the Mr. Tennessee and he was training for the Mr. Georgia. And I met him at Doc's gym and he actually approached me and said, Oh, I, I think I could be a wrestler. And I kind of blew him off. I said, uh, I don't know if, you know, little did I know he'd become the ultimate warrior. Right. And he was a chiropractor at the time, right? Yeah. He was a chiropractor. Yeah. And where was that at that you met him? Doc Neely's gym. Doc, uh, was a big force in the bodybuilding industry at one time. And uh, he was a chiropractor also. And he got in some trouble with the law. You know, back then, uh, they didn't come down on steroids, but he was selling some, you just couldn't sell drugs and steroids. You had to get it through 
prescription and he was black marketing steroids and I he had a bunch of gyms across the country and they closed them all down and I didn't realize I saw it on an interview I think you did with Hannibal that uh Mike was uh, a power lifter I, I didn't I knew Mike had a great body but he was uh you said that one one interview that you think he did 440 as a buck 95 guy buck, not, buck 98 and that that record lasted for over 20 years and Mike never did a steroid in his life. Wow. That is yeah. yeah. That was a state record here for like like Kevin said over 20 years that, that Mike had cleaned Mike Graham uh, uh, debates uh, that much only weighing under under 200 pounds. And the guy the guy and Kevin you were you were you're right there along uh, those weights too, right? I mean that same weight class. Well, I was uh uh, I was not as strong as Mike on the bench, but my uh, thing was a squat. But uh, Mike was so, and Mike was an incredible arm wrestler too. Yeah, you know we go to a bar together. Guys would come up and say, "Hey, I want to arm wrestle you," and I said, "I'll tell you what, if you can beat him, you, I'll arm wrestle." Yeah, yeah. So I would pass him off to Mike. <laughs> What a great you guys, wrestlers we had in the business back then. I mean, you had Rude. Of course, you had yeah. Scott Flash Norton, who was a different level from everybody on the planet. But right, what a group of strong men and uh, arm wrestlers. You know, you also had uh, Kazmaier, our city, when he was right. fighting Ken Lane to be the first yeah. ones to bench press uh, 700 pounds. He was the first one to do it. And then him and Kane, uh, Ken Lane switched back and forth. But what a bunch of strong guys and, and uh, arm wrestlers we had back then. Yeah, we did. I certainly wasn't an arm wrestler, but we certainly did have a lot of them, you know. And uh, uh, I look back at Florida as if I didn't go to Florida, I might not have stayed in the business. I was so lucky, like, like Gerald said, if you even paid any bit of attention from Eddie, you saw the business in a whole different perspective. You didn't see it just as you. You knew that to draw money, you had to have a great opening match. Eddie would put his most uh, technical guys on the opening match. Uh, I remember he had a TV one time I don't, it was George McQuarrie. You remember George McQuarrie? Uh, yeah, oh, George, yeah. George was an alternate on the 68 Olympic team. In this friend kid. of Bob Roop, Bob yeah. Roop's best friend, yeah. And there's a kid that was breaking in the business. It wasn't Fletcher Carr, the guy, your brother Stretch, that was national yeah, champion. Yeah, the Uni University of Tampa, a Division yeah. II national champion, right. And, yeah. you know, he, he, Fletcher Carr's great-grandson just won an NCAA championship for Iowa State here recently. Really? Well, yeah. the, the guy that was under Fletcher came over, and he they broke him in for a little while. And I remember on a uh, Wednesday morning, they had McQuarrie and the guy, and I can't remember his name. And they were giving finishes out, and Eddie said, oh, just go out and shoot. And, they were, and, and George, he, you know how George looked. He looked like he'd be working at a bakery, right? And eat most of the products. Yeah, yeah. He just stretched <laughs> that kid all over. And, you know, and he just had that thing that he knew how to build to bring it to a crescendo, and almost like a rock song. Bring it up, take it down, and then put the hammer to it till the end. You know what I mean? And everybody used to say, well, Florida was built on wrestling. Well, it was built on wrestling with Jack, Dory, you, Terry. I'm going to tell a story about you, the greatest high spot I ever saw in my life. And, uh, but underneath it, start with Eddie, it was blood and guts with Dusty, mm -hmm. Eddie, but it, wrestling was always in the forefront. John, you'll love this story. This is about 1973 when uh, the Funks and Briscoes, I had never seen this done before. They used to send tapes 
of the Briscoes to Amarillo and re-edit the voiceover to make the Briscoes heels. And then they would take those <laughs> matches, they would take those matches from Amarillo and send them back and do the reverse, make the Funks heels. So this <laughs> feud is as hot as it can be. All, you know, when the boys are out at the curtain to watch the matches, you know that they're getting a treat. Everybody's out watching. So it's in Miami. Of course, everybody says sold out, but this one was sold out. <laughs> in comes the Briscoes, the hometown heroes, this big pop. Dory's in front, Terry's behind. Dory gets that championship applause. Terry's getting booed. Well, they get the instructions in the middle of the ring. The Briscoes shake hands with Dory. Terry won't shake their hand. And Cherry, Terry's running around the ring. And Dory's pushing him out. Dory's pushing him out. All of a sudden, the Briscoes turn their backs. Terry makes this beeline like he's going to jump both of them. When the Briscoes hear him coming, they turn around, got their fist up. Terry stops at a dive and sticks his hand out to shake hands. The building <laughs> blew. The building blew. I said, only Terry Funk. Only Terry Funk. Yeah. You know, I, that's right. Because if somebody else tries that spot, th th it's not going to work. No, Terry Funk, no. Terry Funk could do almost anything. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and that, that was another thing that the relationship that he had with old man Funk and they right. with the Funks and the Briscoes. I mean, that went on forever and it never got tiring because the, they did the thing in Amarillo one time where Jack had the figure four on Dory and Dur uh, Senior came over and hit the bell, you know, like he right. did on an yeah. accident and Jack got up or he would have won the title. You know, the, the finishes they were coming up with they were ways to get out without insulting the people where they say the characters that were playing it, they said, oh, I can understand that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it and, and, and it was so creative with, with, with all those guys and, and the ring. And, uh, you know, there were just no egos in, in that bunch. And you could throw the old man in, into a six-man. Sometimes Eddie would come into yeah. a six-man yeah. with us, with, with Joey Funk Sr. So... We played that 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 Funk Briscoe game, uh, you know, for almost twenty years, and with every combination you can imagine, you know, with Dory C, Dory Junior, myself, or, or Terry, and then myself, Jack, and Eddie Graham or Mike Graham. I mean, there, there was all kinds of combinations you can go with it, and it it just seemed to have that certain magic that every once in a while, you know, a, a group of guys hit, and John. John been there with the APA, and you you certainly been there with 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 the plethora of guys that that you worked with. But it it was a good and Eddie Eddie had that whole program figured out. The door the Funk went into titles, the the Briscoes went, and you know the influence that Kevin at the time that Eddie had over the country. You know he was friendly with a lot of southern promoters, but the northern promoters and like Vince Senior and a guy going they 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 idolized Eddie because Eddie was so sharp in the business. I'll tell you a funny story. I went to Kansas City for a brief time and Pat O'Connor took a liking to me. And Pat would bring me to St. Louis on Fridays to be his partner. And I can remember this. It was Harley against Jack and I think Holly was the champion at the time and Pat turned to me and said go call Eddie and get me his get him on the line for me and I said I'll be calling him at home on a Friday what do you need he says we got to get a finish <laughs> they call him from St. Louis on a championship match in Kiel Auditorium to get a finish. Wow. That's how much respect they had for him. Wow. Yeah, exactly. And then he probably told him to go Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Kevin, when I had a bull rope match in uh, up in WWE, and you talk about respect, they uh, weren't sure about what to do for a finish. So Vince had Bruce called Dusty, who was in a different territory at the time, and Dusty gave us the finish for, <laughs> for the bull rope match. He was in WCW. And, and, and we were at WWE and we're battling the damn guys and Dusty gave us a finish, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And that's how much he thought of uh, Dusty that he's going to call him. I think there, there. I don't know if you can but hear Dusty, that, Kevin. No, I didn't. I, I, I was saying when uh, you talk about respect, I did a bull rope match. And I've done a bunch of bull rope matches because you know, I tagged with Dick Murdoch. So, but you know, yeah. Dusty was the king of the bull rope match. So when they do a bull rope match for a championship match in WWE with me and Eddie Guerrero, they weren't sure what to do. So Vince had Bruce call Dusty, who's working for WCW at the time, and give us a finish. And Dusty gave us a finish. It was a hell of a finish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was you probably know, an Andy Graham finish, right, Kev? Yeah, and you know what else, too, uh, that I got to give Eddie real credit for? When Jack finished up in Florida after the championship run, most promoters, and they kind of did it uh, with Morocco, remember? The finish where Morocco came in when your brother took right. the bump? Yeah. Most promoters would say, okay, Jack's not here anymore. Let me get someone that's just like Jack, which is impossible. And maybe get a Morocco type guy at the time. Eddie went completely 180 degrees. He got dusty. So there wouldn't be the comparison between Jack because let's face it, nobody could compare to Jack. Yeah. And he was smart enough to see that he needed a completely different person so no one would say oh that guy's no Jack Briscoe do you know what I'm saying yeah that Kevin that's a hell of a point too you know a lot of people don't realize you know the the the, the way and you described it perfectly the way that the Florida territory was built on racing and everything and and you know Jack was just on this pedestal so high because Eddie had done such a fantastic job, not only building him in the ring, but building him outside of the ring as a citizen of the state right. of Florida, you know, and, that, and, you know, Mr. All-American type guy, you know. And so when it come time to make that change, Eddie didn't want to put pressure on Dusty to be compared with Jack all the time. So, he said, you know, we're going to completely change up. We're going to retool. We're still going to have our base. And Eddie still had the base and, and the foundation, but he had that special attraction in Dusty Rhodes and created him as a special attraction. So he wouldn't get that comparison every day. And, and the other thing is, John, I think Jack Briscoe, when I was in Florida, did one blade job and it almost cost Louis to let his job yeah. in Miami. Well, here's a guy that's an outstanding citizen, wrestling world champion. He has all the credentials in the world as a shooter. No blood. Dusty comes in, bleeds every night. You couldn't, you couldn't compare him. No. And like you said, he had built Jack to such a pedestal that if he tried to follow Jack, it would have killed the territory. And that's how smart to me he was. Exactly. Go ahead, Don. Yeah, Kevin, you're talking about uh, Eddie Graham. Uh, he was a pilot, right? And I heard yeah. a story right. that he flew <laughs> underneath the bridge one time. Yeah. He did a lot. He landed in that. Were you with us one day? He tried to land in that West Shore parking lot there, the big shopping center just due north of the airport. And it's all lit up. And Eddie was all lit up. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, uh, so you guys are riding with a drunk pilot. Yeah. Yeah. Terry yeah. Funk that bother you? Yeah, yeah, I bother me. I was scared for my life every time. Der Terry Funk tells one. Wait, of the wait, best a minute, wait a minute. You're, wait a minute. You're scared for your life every time, which means you did it repeatedly. So you get on the plane, you're scared to death. And then the next night you go, okay, let's get on with the drunk guy again. He's flying. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah go figure. <laughs> You want me to tell the Terry Funk story now, John? 
Oh uh, yeah, I'm I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. I apologize. To you. But you, yeah, I know what you're getting at. We got had to be some stupid, but we trusted Eddie. Eddie was a great pilot. Eddie even impaired, you know. What I mean, <laughs> right, right, Kev. I mean, but yeah. here, 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 we're taking off from Fort Myers, uh, uh, Florida. Fort Myers is down the coast here. It's uh, due north of Tampa, and it's right on the on the Gulf of Mexico edge there. So, if you go west, you're in the Gulf of Mexico. If you go north. You're you're in Tampa. If you go south, you're in Miami. If you go west, you end up uh, somewhere over on the other, other east side of the state there. So they take off, and Eddie 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 Eddie's been enjoying himself during the course of the match. So he takes off, and Terry is sitting co-pilot, and so Terry's sitting there watching. Terry Funk. It, Terry Funk as co-pilot with a drug pilot. We got a crazy man as a co pilot. We're said me, Jack, and Doy are sitting in the back. And we're all wondering if we're going to make it back to Tampa alive. You know? So we hear Terry, and all of a sudden, you know, we go and we start going. We take off to the west. Eddie never makes that right hand turn to go north. He's headed west. Well, he flew down there. Now, Fort Myers, at, you know, in the middle of the night, it's not the city that it was down. They didn't have the, 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 the services, the gas services. So you had to conserve your gas going down there so you'd have enough coming back to Tampa. So we knew that. So Eddie's flying, flying out. And Doria, Jack, and I don't notice anything, but Terry's sitting there. And fortunately, this time, Terry was, was conscious of uh, what was going on. So we keep going. We keep going. About 20 minutes into the flight, Terry starts looking at those gauges, the gas gauge, and then he starts looking at the compass. And that compass is heading due west. And so Terry lets it go a couple more minutes, and all of a sudden we hear, we see Terry elbowing Eddie. Said, Eddie, are you going to make a right hand turn, go to Tampa, or are you taking us back to Texas? Eddie said, oh, oh, oh. Cranks up the stereo, makes a damn right hand turn. We we barely make it into Tampa on fumes. <laughs> what, what was the deal you're going to land in a parking lot? Oh, the, there's that shopping center parking lot there, and it's all lit up there. So we're, we're getting the readings and everything. And Eddie, Eddie didn't like to use instruments. I don't really think Eddie knew how to read instruments, to tell you the truth. And so we're, we're sitting down in this parking shopping center parking lot's all got all these lights and in the, in the, the parking lot there and it's it's right across the road from from tampa international so we're coming down we're coming down and all of a sudden the tower comes on and said eg 69 remember that number Kevin? sure do eg sure 69 do. eddie ram 69 you better you better you better rise up a little bit and then airport another three quarters of a mile across the road to get yourself up and get over here. So uh, we, he gets up, he comes over and he makes a great landing where nobody ever knows any different. He great, makes a great landing. And all of a sudden we see all these, all these uh, lights on, you know, emergency vehicle coming toward the plane. Eddie, Eddie tell, tells Terry, I think it was, or, or I might've been, I can't remember who, who was said Copilot at that, but he, he, he said, when you get off, when we get off the plane, I wasn't flying the plane. You were flying the plane. I, you're, I, I'm instructing you on how to land this thing, and that's the reason you made the mistake. So we sat down, Eddie, 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 and we're getting out there. The other guy, whoever was said uh, co-pilot, gets out. Oh, sir, I'm sorry. Eddie's teaching me how to drive, and I just mistake the uh, the parking uh, shopping lot center for for the runway there. Well. Kid, you better wake Eddie up and tell him you, you messed up, but you made it safe here. Just you guys just be safe and go on. You know, but that that's kind of how Eddie was such a hero in this town. Yeah. Eddie, Eddie could do no wrong. Yeah, he could do no wrong. We we landed the wrong way going down the runway at Tampa International Airport. Several times. Yeah. Several yeah. times? Several yeah. times. <laughs> Isn't that kind of dangerous? Hey, well, I'm Still here, brother. <laughs> hey, you remember those flights? Uh, yeah, we kept taking the plane with it. Sometimes Eddie would, you know, fly us down there. Eddie was great because he was sober going down because he'd been working all day. And Eddie would tell us, You guys go on to the arena. I'll meet you back here at the airport about 10 30. 
you knew then you were in for some excitement. Sometimes we'd catch a ride back when he'd tell us that. And then sometimes we'd be dumb A's and we'd go, go back to the airport and have a laugh. And there's Eddie again. So, you know, knocking down all the cones on the way out to the takeoff. <laughs> <laughs> and he flew under more, a bridge more. one time, Kevin? What? He flew under a bridge one time? Flew under a bridge. He flew on the Skyway, Skyway Bridge. Yeah, Skyway Bridge, yeah. Flew under the Skyway Bridge, but like it's one of those big hump bridges, though, John. You know, it's like a humpback well. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's so like, it makes it safe. Yeah, <laughs> John, it's it's like Gerald said. Eddie was so over, and he was talking about Jack being a citizen and everybody respected him. When me and Mike first came together. The Greco, the mayor of Tampa at the time, came and gave me and Mike an award for our work with the youth in Tampa. So, and then Eddie got a flag from the State Department. It was given to him. Any officer went down, he took care of their family, and I think they got 10% of the gate for a long time. So, and that people that maybe didn't like wrestling and that the kids who were watching wrestling saw all this and they said, well, these guys are good citizens and they got into it. And the way Gordon presented it as a sport, that he did everything possible to raise the standard of pro wrestling. When pro wrestling at the time was looked upon and not very much, but not in the state of Florida. You don't have congressmen and senators and mayors coming on the TV back in those days, especially giving awards out to pro wrestlers. And Eddie was a guy who didn't have a hardly any formal education, right? I think he went he, through sixth grade, but he yeah, was he, also, he, didn't mean to cut you off, Gerald, but he was also a cap, boat captain for big boats, you know, the big tankers. That's how smart Eddie was. As pilot, a ship pilot too. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they bring the big ships in from, uh, from, uh, from the Gulf into the port, you know, they, they, they bring a uh, pilot captain out that steers them in. They don't let the regular boat captain bring the ships in. They'll send a, 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 a trained pilot in that area out because of the, the currents and the different uh, uh, depths of the water. And, and, and it was licensed in that. During that time of, say, the eight, early 80s before you know, Eddie passed away. Was there any talk of Florida going national? Because you've already had uh, the Blanchards down in San Antonio, I think 83, they had USA Network. Then you had ESPN, Carrie and Vern. So you had national TV coming and everybody knew about it. Was there any talk about Eddie doing that? Well, for me, I can remember when TBS started getting strong and we had, uh, Tommy Rich come down for a show. And I said to Eddie, wow, that was a smart move. He said, no, it's the beginning of the end. He said, we were isolated for so long. Now people are seeing TV from all over the country and people are starting to do our angles. And I thought, whoa. He had that foresight. He, he didn't want to he didn't he didn't like the expansion no he didn't and he saw way before anybody else i believe and i think what gerald said earlier about vince and eddie having such a strong relationship florida was the last territory junior came into yeah. And Eddie did Eddie 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 saw what Eddie really knew what cable TV was going to do with the business. He knew he knew at that time it was changing, and and Eddie 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 kind of isolated himself down there. And Eddie was making boatloads of money doing what he was doing here in Florida. Eddie really didn't want to expand. Eddie was at Florida at the end of his 
his his really productive run when cable TV uh, started coming in. And Kevin, you were right there with me. You 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 saw what cable TV was going to do, and you heard all the promoters as you were traveling around. Too. Promoters were scared to death of cable TV. They just didn't know how to take it because they knew it was going to going to cause some disruption. And and Eddie being so isolated like this. You've heard, you've heard, uh, uh, John, you've heard uh, me talk about how Jack and I wanted to expand that Georgia championship wrestling, but we had all that inside, uh, 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 inside uh, animosity towards us because we're wanting to go. And Eddie came up with all these promoters and these other territories, the Geigles, the O'Connors, uh, the Vaughn Eric's, and, and everybody else around the Owens. And so he didn't want to tread on anybody else. And Jack, and that's what Jack and I was wanting to do, and that's basically what led to the uh, to us selling out because the opposition that we had from our partners and, and our friends and, and other territories, no, we can't do this. You know, we're 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 the NWA. Eddie was true and true NWA. In other words, he didn't want to do anything. Very wealthy man. And the, for, you two guys were there. Who did, who did you guys think at the time? Because you, you guys realized at that time that the, did you guys know? Two, two questions. Did you guys know at the time that the territories were probably dead, are, are soon going to be are on the way to the tar pits, let's say, because of cable television? And who did you think was the odds on favorite to compete for the national uh, level of, of whatever was going to happen with the, with the cable companies? With, with me, with me. I knew it would be Vince, and I'll tell you why, Jim Barnett. When Jim Barnett went to Vince, and Jim had expanded WCW, not WCW, Georgia Championship Wrestling, when he went to Ohio and Michigan. Right, West Virginia. West Virginia. All those TV people, the, the directors and higher ups every time they looked at their watch to see what time it is they saw jim barnett because he had given them rolexes and i said nobody knows tv like jim barnett and that's why jim barnett in my mind was such an influence for vince it wasn't like a guy was walking in the door they hadn't dealt with they had dealt with a guy that gave them rolex watches and probably big envelopes at Christmas, and I no, and I knew nobody could compete with them. What did you think, Jerry? Well, I, I thought that, that Jim Barnett was a huge influence on I think on 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 uh, on Vince going nationwide, and he he as as we've discussed in some of Kevin John and I do this little little best of the best uh, uh, right where we review all these classic wrestling matches. We did one uh, we did the the the, uh, the one out of Chicago. Well, Jim Barton, Al Half, who was had national TV at the time out of Chicago. Remember, Kevin? Yeah, this and, is John so Lee. He, one he half of stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. About a year and a half ago, Mr. Briscoe told me with he the said, other territory. You know you're so, going bald. Uh, Jim, Jim, so of course I am. I come from a family when he, when of black men. It's just a matter of time. But it wasn't. He bought Georgia. Fast forward, Mr. Briscoe says your hair grew back. What happened? It's TBS simple. was going the to turn into and that. Just happened is what to, happened to be at the right good ball, time, right but place. But I'm not going to so, find uh, out anytime soon. I, I just two out of three men will experience there, some form Bart of hair loss by the time they're 35. He had already More had than 50 million men in the U.S. suffered from male pattern baldness. Uh, Keeps has uh, more Claire five star reviews than any of its competitors. There are only two FDA-approved medications that can prevent hair loss. Keeps all first both. Convenient I, uh, virtual doctor consultations I, like I said, and medications and delivered straight to your door because of every our three months, with Jim 24 Martin. 7. And care Jim and support. Really Keeps has a network and of expert medical Jack advisors, prescribers, and care specialists to support you and making your hair goals really a reality. Set up and remember, and to you don't have to leave Chris your home. Said to you. Treatments start at just $10 so, uh, per month. Jim would say, hey, and Keep offers generic versions. Of the two FDA Jack approved medications to prevent hair loss. And carry out ready to the take action for it. Prevent and hair so loss. So we kept wanting go to go to and we kept getting this resistance. Slash no, and most JBL, of that GB, was, was not coming from your the, first from month the, of treatment uh, from, free. Uh, where That's I go keeps.com. Uh, 
slash JB to get your first in, uh, month Columbia, free. South Carolina, Georgia. Dot com from Eddie Graham and Jim Crockett, but mostly GBL. Eddie Graham, because Eddie didn't want to trade on any of his buddies there. But we knew it was coming, and when when uh, Georgia guy stock owners decided they they were going to go against Jack and I and not go with us, then that, that's when we started looking elsewhere, and we found somebody that was looking to 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 carry out that vision that we're wanting to do too. Kevin, at what point during this time did you work for Vince Senior? I worked for Vince Senior back in '76, and he was wonderful to me. Uh, my job was to get the next guy ready for Bruno. He'd give me wins like Sparisario would be leaving the territory who had wrestled Bruno. I'd get wins from him. And then I'd wrestle like Brody or Hanson before they wrestled Bruno. So uh, he really took care of me very well. I had nothing but respect. And Vince Jr. at the time was an uh, announcer. And you could see even back then, he was a very, very smart guy. You know, I hear people talk about, you know, competition, about fence. Didn't they make a billion dollars last year? Or more. They're, yeah, they're, they turned in a billion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he was a good commentator. You listen to him from those matches from the seventies. He did commentary as a solo booth. Yeah, he was a good commentator. You know, people like the, the the trendy thing is to bash him for everything. You know, that's right. you appear right. smart if you're negative and cynical. But he was a really good commentator. Yeah, and you were there. Both of you guys were there. He was the best skill in the business at one time. Oh, by far, not by even far. not even close. You know, and it's, it's so interesting because it was it was such a great time in the business because, you know, the Montreal Screwdrop uh, changed the business in the respect that, you know, the war may have ended up the way it ended up anyway with, with Vince winning, but that was the biggest point because that created the evil Mr. McMahon. You know, yeah. now Vince had to get on TV, and then all of a sudden you have Mike Tyson come in after that. You have Stone Cold against Vince. I mean, that was the, the snowball for WWE, but it all started with evil Mr. McMahon. And I agree with you. Greatest character in the history of this business. When when you guys brought in uh, Tyson to wrestle, uh, to referee that match, <laughs> Stone Cold, Kevin, I saw Kevin had an interview with Austin. And he said, when did you know that we were going to beat you? He said, when I came into Nitro one night, and Kevin Sullivan walked up to me and he said, brother, the water's cold and it's getting high, ain't it? <laughs> I said, the Titanic's at the iceberg and we're taking it on quick. So, I was yeah, just I mean, with Kevin. We just filmed the WWE Rivals for A&E, a, a combination of A&E and WWE. And he just told the same story. I heard it again. And it's a, Kevin Nash tells the best stories. He's got oh, more analogies. He's obviously a very smart guy because he has more analogies. You come up and, you know, it's one of those things like, why did I think about that? Damn it. Damn that man. Uh -huh. Yeah, he's a smart guy. Kevin and I are good friends. And, you know, Kevin's like you. He's a renaissance man. He knows his wine. He knows paintings. He's traveled. He's been in the service. He has great perspective on life and wrestling. You know what I mean? But we used to laugh about that uh, one time him and I were watching uh, he was no longer the booker I was no longer the booker and we were watching what was happening and I said this isn't even a good soap opera that they're trying to do you know what I mean that we had such crazy shit uh, uh, huge erectus or whatever the guy's name was Viagra <laughs> I said this is not even a uh, a good pilot for a reality show and I actually think that's what they were trying to do I think they were trying to develop a reality show Interesting. Kevin, 
uh, 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 to jump out, jump out of that that there, and uh, you, you you had your run in Florida. When did you head out of Florida, and uh, you headed to where at that time? You, you, did you go out west? Or yeah, I went to Florida? San Francisco, and I had a very good run there. Uh, Roop and I actually sold uh, Cow Palace out four times in a row. We did a thing where he was supposedly uh, part of uh, like a. a extended family and he busted my fictitious brother's shoulder and I came out and I said I won't be here long I'm just going to beat him up so after the first match we had it was like a double DQ and the second match my actual father came out and I beat Roop and it wasn't for the title but it was you know a Boston street fight my father came in the ring and hugged me Roop drove a knee in my back then he picked up my father, who was 68 at the time, and gave him a shoulder breaker, and we were off running. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, and from there, you know, I kind of went to Kansas City for a short time, but I went to the Gulf Coast with the Fools, who had a great territory, you know. Oh, yeah, great, yeah. Went to both of them, and uh, then I went back, migrated back to Florida with Dusty. Were you in uh, San Francisco with uh, Ray Stevens? I was going to tell you a story about Ray Stevens. Ray Stevens, you know how you, you say you can't replace like Jack Briscoe? Well, I had the envy, most, most least envious job in the world coming in behind Ray. And the angle kind of got over. But before the angle got over, I was in some tag matches with the Von Brauners. And they brought Stevens in to be my partner. So I said to him, uh, I had such a respect for him. I said, Mr. Stevens, uh, how do you want me to solve for you to give you the tag and you do the bombs away? He said, hey, kid, this is your town now. I'll do the sell and you take the fall. I couldn't believe it. You know. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Rick Flair just recently said something about Ray Stevens that he's talking about the greatest workers of all time. He said St Stevens was the greatest worker of all time. He, now, he said that the promos he did were not equal to the work that he did, but his work was, in Ric Flair's opinion, the greatest of all time. How, 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 how was it being out there with him? I mean, I was getting over, and I got a little bit of a chair, but when he came out, it was almost like a with me, right behind me. It was almost like a Hogan pop. Or <laughs> Or as the road warriors used to say, a road warrior pop. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's right. And That's right. He, was, he, he was over so big, and his work was so tight. Did he ever work with Jack? What a match that would have been. I don't believe so. I don't, I don't think he ever did. They would have had an incredible yeah. match. I, I know Ray came down here, but Ray was at the very end of his career. And I, I, I know they worked in the Carolinas a little bit because Ray, Ray was up there at the same time, too. I, I, that's when I got to work with him, and he was at the end of his career. So it wasn't the same Ray Stevens, but you could, and there were flashes during the course of the match where you could feel that greatness, you know, how it is in the ring sometimes, where you just know, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, Kevin, uh, not, not to jump around a ton, but I want to ask you about Bret Hart. Uh, you know, Bret Hart, when during that Montreal Street job they were talking about, you know, the big moment, uh, you know, where you created the evil Mitch McMahon character, you got Stone Cold come in, then you got Vince versus Stone Cold, which became this super hot angle. Bret Hart goes down to WCW, a little bit diminished because of the screw job. Uh, you know, no longer the champion coming down, but now he's the, he's still hot. He's still one of the hottest guys in the middle. Why did he not go on TV right away and do something in WCW? You know, at that time, Hogan had total, total control. And I, I'm just, this is uh, me surmising, John. Do you remember when Brett and him had to go to Vince's office and he said to Vince, he told me he was going to put me over and Vince said, that's what you heard. I don't think the golden goose ever let that go. 
meaning Hogan. And I think he was stifled right from the start. I mean, he should have been able to walk over. We should have drawn big money but right, right away. Yeah, it was such a seminal moment, you know, where you're right at that pivotal point where the ratings are starting to catch up. Right. And then WCW gets Brett, but doesn't utilize him right away. And we get evil Mr. McMahon out of it, which nobody knew was going to be created. And the that's when the trajectory started going two different directions. Right, right. And, uh, you know. Kevin, when did you take over the book there? Uh, was, was it during that time? No, I took the book over when Hulk first came in. Hulk came to me and said, can you take us there? I said, yeah, I can take you to the promised land, but we're going to have to. You, and I said to him, you're going to have to turn heel eventually. And he said, oh, no, no, no. I had a really worked for about two years to have him see that that he had to turn heel. And what I think finally convinced him because he's starting to get booed in the buildings. And this is how great Gene Oakland was. He came out in Chicago, which is a half ass heel town anyway, right? And he was dressed just for an interview. He was all in black and had a black bandana on and the whole building booed him out. And Gene said, you can hear the solemn move mood tonight in the building. Uh, you, they can tell, they can see evil is around and Hogan took the mic and did an interview and they were booing the whole time and he came back and I said, I'm right. And the night he turned heel, I was living in Daytona, a mile from the ocean center. I made him stay at my house and sleep at my house the night before. I waited till the first match was in the ring because his agent came and was trying to talk me out of it. His agent went to go to a bedroom. I said, no, no, that bedroom's, <laughs> you can't go in there. You got to sleep on the couch. I didn't want him to be waking up in the middle of the night, you know, and sneaking into the Hulk's bedroom. I waited till the first match was on, then we got in Hulk's limo and drove down. But the proof is in the pudding. When he came down and he turned, they were standing ankle deep in trash. The fans had turned. And I've heard people say, well, it could have been Sting. It could never have been Sting. He was WCW original. It had to be the three guys from New York. And it had to be Hogan because he wasn't drawing as a baby face anymore. How close were you to going to plan B? And, and, and was there a- I never was going to go to plan B, John. I wouldn't have had him at my house in handcuffs just about. Oh, so you knew from the, I'm, I'm, I mean, Rev, I apologize. So you knew from the night before that, that Hogan was going to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, and <clears throat> up until uh, about a week before he was all for it, that everybody that was riding on his coattails that were getting to go to his towns or getting a piece of them. His lawyer, Henry Holmes, called me. Oh, he's going to lose endorsements. And I said, he's going to lose endorsements if he isn't drawing money. So I, that was, I've heard people say, well, he's going to be staying or even Mabel. In my mind, I was going to either get a shotgun and take him to the ring myself. or uh -huh. There was going to be two NWO guys wrestling the three of them. Because it wouldn't so there, work. So there never was a, a plan B for Sting, and he never, he didn't. I mean, it wasn't like you right up till the moment of the match. You knew that Hogan was going to do this, even though all of his hanger on people were trying to get him to stay. Yeah, um, I, I think that when I went to him that night after in Chicago, it dawned on him that he had to do something. You know what I mean? Here he had been cheered. In, in Chicago, it used to be a good time for him. Right. I think when he went to Chicago and he saw how Gene switched it, and Gene came back and he just said, oh, tough crowd, tough crowd. You know how Gene was, right? Doing the Rodney Dangerfield. Right. <laughs> I think he realized then he had a turn. And it, was, it was great for him. And he was with, you know, the two hottest guys we had, Nash and Hall. 
Uh, it's one of the greatest storylines of all time. And, and it, it became this thing that, you know, they're just, you know, I was in WWE. So when I say we, WWE, yeah. you guys were killing us. I mean, just killing us in the ratings with those three guys. And I don't think maybe 20 years from now, it can be, you can capture it again. But that was lightning in a bottle. Nobody knew how successful it was going to be. But I got to give credit to, to Holland Nash because I went down to see the first interviews they did and they did them in Orlando. I don't know if you remember them. They were black and white and Hogan kicked, kicked a, a, a big beach ball that looked like the uh, world. I watched those promos and I said, whoa, whoa. And Nash came up to me and Eric and said, this can't fly because Hulk was doing Hulk interviews. So Nash came up with the idea, and I think Scott did too. He said, let's just do sound bites. And they stepped back, and then those sound bites made Hogan cool because those guys were cool. And Hulkamania had run its course, and they were smart enough to know the position that the biggest babyface of all times is turning heel, and we're with them. We're not going to mess this thing up. We're going to make him look good. And they did. Yeah, and what a lot of people uh, don't realize is all those guys were on one roster at one point. I mean, right. in 95, you had Hall and Nash uh, with WWE, but they were Diesel and Razor. You had yeah, right. Triple H, who was an aristocrat. You had Kane, who was a dentist. And you had Stone Cold, who was a ringmaster. You know, so you had these guys. It just... The, 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 they needed to morph into their next character, which a lot of people have to morph into the next character before they make it. Very few guys come out like Jack Briscoe and are Jack Briscoe their entire career. Most of them find iterations, and one of those sooner or later, those iterations either become successful or they go back to driving a truck. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I look back at our, our locker room, it was like the 1927 Yankees. You had Hogan, Nash, Hall, Sting, Macho Man, <laughs> yeah. uh, Luger. Wow. I mean, uh, the Mexican boys, the European, the Japanese. I mean, it was a murderer's row, you know what I mean? And, you know, you guys were making the transition from a, a bunch of, a lot of cartoon characters. And if you look at it, the Mr. McMahon character brought into the reality of what the NWO is bringing in. And John, I, I got a question. Were you there at the night of the Montreal school job? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, I, and I, I did not, I, long story, I'm short, I hope. I'm flying to Japan the next day for a five week tour with Barry Wendell, uh, okay. with, with Baba. So we were wanting to get the hotel. So I stayed till almost the finish and okay. so I saw Earl Hebner get his bag and go to the car. And I asked Tim White, I said, hey, is there anything uh, big going to happen? I've got this flight to Japan the next day. You know, back then, a lot of guys would leave, you know, once the man yeah. got in the ring. And he said, no, no, nothing's going to happen. No big deal. I saw Taker there. I thought that was strange, but I knew that he was there in case Brett didn't want to do the job to Sean, but would do it to Taker. So I understood why he was there. You know, those things happen every once in a while. You bring a guy in in case something happened. But no, I was there at I was there that day, and I was there right up until the finish. But I left right before it. Okay. Circumstantial evidence you don't get convicted on, right? It has to be un, undeniable. The documentary crew's there. Vince gets spit on. Later on, he gets punched in the face and staggers out, and then all of a sudden the Mr. McMahon character is developed. To me, you know Vince McMahon a lot better than I do. If someone spit on him, that guy ain't coming into the ring. If he gets punched, he ain't gonna fight. I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things, and I'm not into conspiracies. There's okay. enough shenanigans uh, around. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you a little more uh, fuel here, okay? Okay. Yeah. The the Vince McMahon, I've seen him when he blew out his. I didn't see him when he blew out the quad. He blew out his quad in the morning doing squats. 
He can't get surgery until Monday. He comes to TV that day, despite the fact he blew out his quad that morning in Stanford and does TV all day with a broken quad and will not acknowledge that he's hurt at all. After the punch, he sells back to the dressing room. Next yeah. day, we, we go in for just a little bit because we wanted to see what was going to happen. We got this flight to Japan, but I got to see what's going to happen. We see Vince. Later that night, he has a black eye for one of the photos. He didn't have it that morning. Now, it may have developed during the day, fair enough, and it may just be a work that he was building on, you know, what happened, which is my suspicion, but a few more little fuels for the conspiracy fire. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and the documentary crew was the one that got me, you know. Well, yeah, there, we don't have to go yeah. back very far at all. Gerald Briscoe is the one that orchestrated the <laughs> entire Montreal screw job, Gary. I'm sure he did. He did. Uh, I, I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening to to this conversation here, and I uh, and Kevin, uh, you know the, the the amount of respect I, I have uh, have for you, and uh, but we I, I met with Vince the night before. Yeah, we we discussed everything. Vince had no uh, Vince. We we kind of I I kind of said oh, something's going to happen at ringside. He said I know it. He said you got to keep me back if something does happen. And, and so we, we hadn't planned on the dressing room visit at all. We had kind of, we either knew he was going to get spit on or hit at ringside where we thought it was going to happen. And Vince never once factored that in, into what we were going over. And I, I swear to you, it was never, never considered. The documentary crew was set up months and months ahead of time. I mean, that, that was already written into the book that Brett was bringing the documentary crew there. So that was just, they were the, the luckiest people in the world to could capture that, you know. But uh, I know where you, uh, you're, you're insinuating a problem might, might have been a work, but if, if there's a work, man, it's been the greatest work in the history of our business, and they they outworked the worker, as, as they say in the business, because they, if it was, they outworked me. I, the details that, that Vince and I went over the night before was covering all the what ifs. You know, it wasn't, uh, or he's going to do this, and what if this situation happens? And, and, uh, and you know, we happened to cover the, the end ring. The, the reason we decided to go to the dressing room was because Undertaker was pounding on the door saying, you guys got to go talk to talk to the locker room down there. Okay. That's, that's, that's the only reason we made that walk down there to the dressing room. And when we got down there, my biggest fear was if something did happen, and it was Shane McMahon jumping in on it. And I and and when Vince got nailed, Shane made a move and Sarge had to grab him, you know, to keep it. And if it if it'd been a work, Shane would would have been more involved in it, I think. And okay. I, but it, to me, I, I I just think I I I know there's conspiracy theories that you know it was all a big work because me. And number one reason is because of the documentary series there. But he and I laid out all the what if in the world. And, and you know, and that wasn't one of them. That just happened to, to happen, you know, and that Brett, when Brett, Brett nailed him. And uh, so I, 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 got, I got to disagree with both of you on, on, on the conspiracy theory. Now, it? wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not disagree. I, 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 I don't think it's a conspiracy and I don't think it was a work. I'm just telling you what I saw. I, what I thought was, is from what I saw was that it was not a work because I saw the guys in the back, you know, before the match, there was uh, this work would have been exposed by now. I think uh -huh. the next day when Vince didn't have the black eye, but it, he, he appeared to have one on television, either it came along throughout the day or he's decided to make this oh, shit. something a little bit bigger. And that's what I thought it was, was that it was a shoot, but that Vince was going to make this into something a little bit bigger by, hey, we've got something here. Let's go with it, is, is my opinion. You talk about making chicken salad out of chicken shit. That's how smart Vince is. We'll yeah. See. We'll right. say it's a good shoot. He, yeah, and he, I think he realized right away, you know, this is something huge. And I yeah. think that's why he sold a little bit on the way back. Because yeah. 
that part because that part's a bit of a work doesn't yeah. mean that the first part was right and because right. the next day his his eye may have been a little makeup that doesn't mean the punch wasn't real i thought i think right. all of that was real i just think vince was making like you say right. chicken salad out of chicken shit yeah but i mean uh he sells nothing i mean you, you he goes to tv with a ripped quad you know and stays there all the day pretty amazing Oh, he, he does. He literally doesn't sell anything. It's, it's unbelievable. You can't get anything out of him. I remember when he had surgery uh, on his hip, he, he hated when somebody would bring it up and say, Vince, how you feeling? It's almost like you insulted him by asking. He's like, I'm fine. Fine. And he, cause he wants to talk about business. Yeah. You're on you, Gerald. We see Gerald, you. what are you doing? Will you stop? Stop. It, doing the instruments and we're not going to fly with you anymore <laughs> <laughs> he, he can't hear until he gets his ears in he's deaf. i'm having te technical issues there uh what what was the question I, I, we but, just figured I, out I, it was I, all the work <laughs> yeah well it was well, what i what i i i gotta say and, and you know we're all we've all been there we've all been punched in the eyes you don't immediately get a black eye. No, no. I mean, that that knot was there when we left the building. I rode in a limo back with him to the hotel. He had a he had an egg on the side of his head, the size of an egg. And uh and uh, I don't know what 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 you what you mean by the, the, the maybe maybe later on he might have put a little makeup on there, but the eye don't turn black immediately, you know. Did it turn back? Because see, I, I thought I thought when he's going to make up, he's enhancing the, the black eye because I didn't yeah. see the black eye. Jerry, what my point was when you were having technical difficulties was that <laughs> I thought it was a shoot, but that and now you're having technical difficulties again. Yeah, I am. And I, I thought it was a shoot, Jerry, but I thought that Vince was making something out of it by working part of it at the end that had nothing to do with whether the screw job was legit or the punch was legit or anything else. He was creating the Mr. McMahon character on the fly. Is what I thought. And Jerry's gone, so our show's going to be a lot better. <laughs> hey, Kevin, I want to ask you about. Before, before I know we we'll keep you a long time, but I want to ask you about uh, something I, I saw the uh, interview you did talking about when uh, Barry Windham was in line to be the uh, NWA champion. Right. And this, what you were telling was, was that David Von Erich was going to be champion. I right. think he was going to end up losing it to maybe Magnum and then Magnum to Barry. Yeah. But you had all three ended up with some crazy things. You know, Magnum, unfortunately, had the horrible crash. Right. Uh, David passed away in Japan. And Barry had a falling out with Dusty. But right. how wild the NWA could have been if those three guys who were incredible workers, that would have come to fruition. And you know, here's something I, on that interview, I also said, Flair might not have gotten the belt back because like you said, David would have held it for two or three years, Magnum, maybe two years, Barry, and then maybe they put it on Kerry. Uh, so we're talking about, even if the, they got a two run year piece eight years before Rick would get the belt for any length of time. So yeah, it would have been a, it would have shook up the wrestling business. I'm not knocking Rick Flair because Rick Flair is Rick Flair and he goes 60 minutes every night, but that would have shook up the wrestling business a little because they were the young bucks coming in and John, you, 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 you're still very involved up there. Roman Reigns, they better get the most out of him they can, in my opinion, because he's going to Hollywood. You know what I'm saying? That guy's going to Hollywood because my wife, who doesn't really watch a lot of wrestling, walked by and saw him and she, her head turned around like Linda Blair's. She said, <laughs> she said, who is he? Now, The Rock is the number one uh, actor, right? How many more years does he have doing all these movies where he doesn't want to get behind 
the camera. They all end up doing that, becoming directors and producers. He has a big production company. Roman has been in a movie with him. He could be in another movie with him. And eventually, I uh, did you think six years ago, John Cena would become a huge movie star? I thought he had a chance when he got his first did movie. You? I did too. When he got his first movie. Now, number four, no, I just thought he'd be a wrestler. You know, I, you never know. You know, when a guy, what is that? I didn't know what his aspirations were. But what do you think? Cena is such a smart guy that when he yeah. got his first movie role, I thought he's going to do really, really well. He's, he's one of the most talented guys I've ever met. What about Roman? What do you think? Do you think he'll be a movie star? I think if that's his aspiration, yes. And yeah. I, and I don't know if it is or not. You know, you can only wrestle, as you know, you, you can only right. wrestle so long. But Roman, I've worked as an agent for just a few months, and it drove me nuts, and I had to quit. <laughs> Roman Roman was, was probably the smartest guy I worked with that entire time. Roman is a brilliant guy. I would sit down with him. He had a mind for the business. He had a mind for the match. And this isn't now. This was back many years ago before all these WrestleMania main events. He was that good. Right. Then. I think right. the world of Roman well, I saw Ro I I saw Roman at, at, at uh, when it was when the CFW or whatever the name was down here. Roman was so far ahead of the class in thinking, you know, about his future and what he wanted to be. That there, uh, you could see it. I mean, at an early stage in his career, this guy was one way street, and that was to the business stuff. Now, if he takes that same passion and goes to the movies. There's no doubt in my mind with the contact and then his uncle or, yes. or cousin or whatever the hell it is that he'll make it. You know? Yeah, and you, you can't uh, tell me that uh, uh, Rock isn't going to produce a movie for him. You know what I mean? He he'll he'll he, the guy has his own production company. He yeah. uh, not, he's in every movie. He has every you know Disney and everybody else uh, after him. He could get Roman into anything that he wants to when Roman wants to. That's my my take on that. I agree with you hundred percent. I and I think I think uh, Dwayne has that uh, that vision for Roman. Whether or not Roman has it at this point of his life, or whether he does about for uh, for Roman. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, I'd be interested to hear, Kevin, because back in the, I don't know, late 90s, uh, when Vince first started getting a, a plane flying all the time, sometimes because I lived uh, in New York, and shortly after that, I'd fly with him. And I remember him outlining his vision. Uh, you know, he did it for several people, but it was also, you know, he had a vision of, of academies in different countries about territories and different, similar to what's going on right now. And it was really cool to see that and to hear that and then see it play out over the next 20 years, I'd love to hear Rock's vision of what he wants to do. I mean, here's a kid who had nothing. I say kid, you know, when he first started, kid had nothing. He's worth half a billion dollars or whatever it is now. He owns I, Hollywood. He did a billion dollars in movie sales one year. I'd love to see what he's going to do next because he has the Midas touch. John, I used to go over to his grandmother's house because I booked Hawaii. <clears throat> I used to go over to his grandmother's house. There'd be an 11-year-old kid there. Uh, you know, skinny, big feet. I used to say, well, oh, you, know, you, you know, if you put me in a time capsule and I, I could have gone back then, you know, I would have said, hey, ink this piece of paper. You know, it's just 10%, you know, of anything. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> he... He, 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 to me, the thing I really admire about him, everybody in that business, and including our business, pro football, baseball, any entertainment business, somebody's knocking you, or somebody is digging dirt on you when you were 13 years old. This guy never makes a mistake he had it is no duis there's no kevin hart crack ups there's no uh tiger woods running his cars into telephone poles and his wife bashing it with a golf club 
this guy has kept himself so, and I've noticed this, you know, he gets up at 4.30 in the morning and trains, right? I see where that uh, Wahlberger, uh, not Donnie, what's the- Mark, Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, he gets up now at 4.30 in the morning and he's training and they, and Joe Rogan's doing it. And they all got the hyperbaric changer, chambers and they're all doing, they're chasing the rock. He's very influential in this entertainment world. And unbelievable from what you said to, from where he came from, which sometimes really hurts people most in it, I would say most of the time, your environment can either make or break you. And he overcame a lot of bad negative stuff. And my hat's off to him. My hat's off to him. Yeah, and it was it makes me actually mad. I mean, when when people try to cancel the rock for something he said, uh, yeah. you know, 15, 20 years ago, whatever it is. I'm not gonna talk about what it what it was, but here's a guy who took care of everybody around him, who took right. care of his mom, who took care of his dad. And like you say, he doesn't have any scandals. And yeah. he's worth half a billion dollars. This is a great American story. And it just absolutely pisses me off when people try to this cancel culture about the rock. It's, it's, screw you. <laughs> this, you're gonna go see his movie. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever see the, the, the little film clip of Haku being at his house one day at at Otis House in Florida? And no. she she says, he says to Ada. Where's Dwayne? She said, oh, he wants the story. He'll be right back. He comes back and there's this crazy looking truck. You know what I mean? Big tires, got everything on it, chromed out. He walks up to Haku and says, hey, here's the keys. He said, what? What do you mean? He said, oh, it's your truck. He did it to his the stunt man. This guy gives back. I mean, he isn't, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're not here. Yeah, Ke 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 Kevin, we just uh, go ahead, John. I'm sorry. We, we, we had downtown we Harvey, Harvey Whippleman. Uh, you know, same thing. He helped Rock get started. Rock lived with him. And, uh, you know, Harvey's saved every dime he's ever made. He's now a councilman or city councilman or something down there in Mississippi. And he shows up to Young Rock, the movie set. And same thing, gives him this massive Mac Daddy truck. You know, there's Harvey, this tough old guy, you know, been in the business forever. But tears in his eyes because of what Rot dig for him. Uh, yeah. It's just, you know, stuff like that. I mean, good grief, man. Go cancel somebody else. This, this man ain't yeah. being canceled. Yeah. yeah. It's just what? a cool story, you know. And, and you also, you realize that in this business, it's not like, and I, look, I played a very short time in the NFL. It's not like NFL players, and I mean no disrespect to these guys, but if you're a terrific talent and you can play corner or linebacker or lineman or running back, you don't have to be able to talk. You don't have to be able to have a personality. But in this business, you have to have everything right. to be able to make it. And you're starting to see that. And I think that's one of the changes in this business perception is when guys like Stone Cold get out there, when guys like John Cena get out there and The Rock get out there and Jesse Ventura, as crazy as Jesse has become governor and Kane become mayor of Knox County, you know, whether you agree with them politically or not, these are really smart guys. And if you're successful in this business, generally you have to be a pretty smart guy because it's not just athleticism. You've got to be able to have the entire package around it. And that's what's different about this business. I think you're absolutely right. And that's one reason that Jerry uh, tries a hard time staying on a, on a Zoom call for ah. <laughs> Hey, Kevin, before we go, I want to ask you one more thing. I got you here. We had Lex Luger on. And uh, I, me and Jerry watched the, the cage match with Brody and Luger. And yeah. it was crazy. I mean, it wasn't like Brody got crazy and was going to beat him up or something. Brody just stood there, did nothing. I mean, just it, insane. It made no sense. You were there that day. No. No. Here's the thing. I became Booker the night before, but I was in Pensacola. And I. they asked me the finish, what the finish should be. And I said, listen, this was built before me. Go to Brody and Luger and have Frank, because Frank was a smart guy, 
come out with something where Luger almost gets out the door and Frank grabs him and Frank, they both fall out, but Frank hits the floor first. What I think happened, and I knew Brody very well. Here's the crazy thing. I probably wrestled him a hundred times and out of the hundred times, 90 times I was the heel. So I knew Frank and I had seen Frank do this before where he just gets so frustrated that he goes and sits in the turnbuckle. So I think what happened was Luger was scared shitless going into it. He thought Frank, he, you know, he bought into Bruiser Brody, not Frank Goodish. And Frank maybe gave him a potato and he thought he was going to get killed and climbed out of the cage. You know, and Brody, from what I saw the film, the next day they had the film because we're going to put it on TV. And we couldn't put it on TV. I said, I believe I was there in Tampa the next day. And I said, I just believe that he got scared to death of Frank. And then when I talked to him, he said, I have a family and I wasn't going to get beat up. And he might have thought that some way, whoever was the booker before me, I can't remember, was going to try to get Brody to do something to him. So it's crazy. It's a crazy, yeah, it's a crazy match. Brody just at one point just stood, yeah. stood in the turnbuckle yeah. and yeah. Didn't, didn't do anything. Nothing. Yeah. There. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that that that's one of the most insane things I've I've seen in a long, long time. That that, that Brody just it's like it wasn't it wasn't even in the ring. <laughs> he was just standing there. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. That, and Luger Luger buzzed in him and everything. And you could see the the the, the expressions change on Luke's, uh Luger's face, you know, when he had knelt him, Brody wouldn't do nothing, you know. He, yeah. he'd look over at the referee to kind of look out at the people, you know. What am I supposed to do? Like he's asking them, what am I supposed to do now? You know? Yeah. But, 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 uh, you know, in defense of Lex, I, I, I just feel Lex was put into a position where he had no experience. You know, he was, he was relatively new newcomer on the block at that time. And he, he didn't really know how to handle a situation like that. And that's something that Matt through the school didn't teach him. <laughs> and uh, Jerry's completely right. He shouldn't have been in that match with Brody. And there was no reason to have a cage match. It was probably the first time he's ever wrestled Brody. It was. It was the first time it he was. ever wrestled he was Brody. On, he was on our show, you know. Yeah. So it, the, the cage didn't mean anything. They were desperate to draw a house and they thought a cage would mean something with Brody. You know, just throwing in a cage doesn't mean anything. There gotta be a reason why, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and I agree with, with, with Jerry. In, in defense of, of Lex, you know, he's just sitting there looking at this monster who's looking at him. Brody wasn't doing anything. <laughs> it, it was, Again, it's just people got to go see it to believe it. It's one of the craziest things in, in this business history where Brody just decides to stand there in the yeah. middle of a main event cage match, just decides <laughs> to stand there. Yeah, it was crazy. Well, Kevin, tell, uh, tell us what you're doing now because I know you're working some with uh, my dear friend, uh, James Beard down in Texas. James helped me uh, get me started with uh, Skandor Akbar and the boys down in Texas. And uh, tell, us, tell us what you're doing now. Well, I'm mostly going to conventions. I was working with James. I'm not right now. Uh, I've been out of the house enough weekends, and I wish them well. But uh, I've been going around to these conventions like Joe's been going. I've been having a good time. It gets me out of the house once in a while. You're a guy who, from, like what, from what Jerry said, two years in the business, we were talking before you came on uh, and uh, said how smart you were in this business. You obviously have a great mind for this business, a huge passion for this business. Do you miss it? Do you miss not being in it? And are you looking for an outlet? Well, here's the thing. As you get older, you know, you kind of, like Satchel Page said, don't look back. Something may be gaining on you. <laughs> but your brain, if you keep it right, you still know what to do. And do you see mistakes, uh, at least you think they're mistakes. And th there should be something passed down, you know what I mean? That, okay, you don't need to be working full time, but give some guys an idea, like 
we've had great talkers in this business, but that MJF, I don't know how he learned to talk. You know, he and I saw him and Punk have an interview that was as good as interview I've ever seen. So it, it excites me to see that these young guys are coming along, some of them, but some of them need help. And I hope everybody succeeds because there's a lot of guys wrestling out there and they, they need to be working. What do you see in the business, uh, say, going forward, say, the next five or ten years? Because I am I have a feeling Vince is going to live to be 180, but uh, he's and he's still going to be in charge. and <laughs> People are still going to be mad at him, and he's still going to be selling out Texas Stadium. But what do you see in the next, say, five to ten years of your, your years of watching and being in the business? If Vince stays in the business, there'll always be a WWE it'll always draw like that. He's branded that company's name. It's like you go into an NFL game, you go into the WWE. The only thing I see negative is, and this is, I'm not trying to knock anybody. People buy a ring, they run towns, not in shape like you or Gerald were, no personal training. They run towns with people that have no training ability or haven't been trained. You go to a town that's never had wrestling, they see that product and they're not gonna come back. I think they've, outside of, AEW is doing great. I guess they just bought Ring of Honor. Uh, MLW is doing pretty well. I guess Impact's doing pretty well, WWE. But as I go, sometimes I've been to some of these independents. Some of them have very good talent, but most of them are guys that have bought a ring and own the company and want to be the star. I don't know how bad that's going to hurt but if I go that there the first time and I go the second time I may be turned off the wrestling forever because it used to be John even when you got in the business and I got in the business a lot earlier than you it was they didn't make it easy on you now anybody can be a wrestler just by a ring and I think that hurts startup companies. Yeah, I agree. I agree because people don't often di differentiate between groups. Right. They see wrestling and they put it all in the same umbrella. And if they have a good experience, wrestling has a good experience to them. If they have a bad experience, wrestling has a bad experience to them. And it's not relegated to whatever business they might have went and watched that wrestling from. It's just the overall umbrella. Yeah. The way I see it too, you know, I, during my my time as a scout, I I covered a lot of independent wrestling organizations. I went to a lot of small shows. I saw what you're talking about, Kevin, where where these guys would get them a ring, and all of a sudden they're they're the territorial champion of champion of their own alphabet soup, you know. But also, you know, and as you know, and you're working for one, there there are companies out there that take a lot of pride in the product, and so. You know, overall, it's not it's not not like that because there are there are certain factions up like up in Iowa, up in Milwaukee, and down in, in Texas, and there's even even a couple of small uh, promotions here in, in Florida that take a lot of pride in their product and try to put a good product out there too and build an audience because they run monthly shows. So, I I you know I I I've never been more pleased with what I see in, in professional wrestling. Now there, there's, there's two or three companies that are thriving. One, one's going to be the, the, the alpha male and they're always going to be the alpha male. There might be a, an alpha male B, but they're not going to be that alpha male A because that's already established out there. But uh, I, I think, I think like, like you said, that young man over AEW, what a promo he did cut. I mean, that was an excellent promo and they've had some excellent matches over there. Uh, but it's once again, you know, how long is 
what will they stand a test of time like Vince did? Will they be here 35 years from now, 38 years from now, saying, hey, look what we started from? Right, right. It's amazing what he's done. 38 years. <laughs> and you look and at all the and you look at all the battles. You know, Crockett yeah. was a small, smart guy. You know, Fritz had a great territory. Vern did too. So did Eddie Graham. You know, and, yeah. and Vince is the sole survivor. He fought a billionaire before. He fought the federal government. You know, he's yeah. pretty much he's pretty much undefeated. Doesn't mean he'll stay that way. But right. if you're betting on but if you're betting on somebody being there, I think you're right. That they're, they're always gonna be there. And you know, he's always been he's always been the top guy. Yeah. Vince is the best when he's at when he's everything's falling down around him. I know Jerry's seen this. Yeah. When everything's great, Vince is almost bored. It's like when everything crashes around him and his top guys quit and go somewhere else, he's like, cool. Now I get to work. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Kevin, I can't thank you. I've been looking forward to this for so long. I, you know, when, when uh, you were down in the Keys in, in the in your gym, uh, you know, we stopped off. Me and Dr. Tom, I believe, was stopped off just to pay respect to you because there's you so many great things much. about you. Uh, that was very nice. Thank you. It was out of respect well, yeah. and admiration, and I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I, I knew you're going to be awesome. You are awesome, and thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And Thank Kevin, you. I want I want to apologize uh, that I, I I my technology uh, uh, expertise just went to hell today. I don't know what what happened, but I had that, that perfect storm of internet going bad, knocked me off my my phone going bad, my computer won't get my emails. I could go JB, on and hey, on and on, but J I got Kevin Sullivan on there. JBL and I know why you're from Oklahoma. He oh. right. That is exactly oh. what it is. There it is. Thank it's you, from guys. From north of the Red River. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. Have a good week.